yeah, 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 yeah. So we're back. We're back. We're back. And I got the most, the most going on this week, the following week. Had the most going on last week. Need to listen. It's been busy. It's been busy. But I'm here. And you're here still. And I appreciate you for that. I thank you for that. I hope that the content that I'm bringing you is enriching your downtime and making your music experience a little better, you know? So, or the way that you experience music a little bit better. I hope so. Okay, so me and my band, Red Butter, are going, which is just me and my friend. <laughs> Not a big, I said me and my band, like it's seven people. Just me and my friend, DJ Red Handed, we are going on a little mini tour. I don't want to be pretentious and call it a tour because it's just one state, but it's the big state. It's Texas. And we're going to be zigzagging around Texas for the next maybe about two weeks all right yeah for yeah so for about the next two weeks we're going to be zigzagging around texas for south by southwest right so i got my gopro sitting over there just got a uh some new gopro batteries um also got the the um the uh the the micro sd <laughs> yeah man i got all that stuff so i'm ready i'm gonna be on some blogger types real blogger Real blocker mission while I'm out there. All right, but back to it. So um, this week, let, let's just do a, a brief recap of the beat I did. Uh, I did a little something different with the stems this time. Instead of um, exporting, instead of just recording them out into an Ableton session for you guys, what I did was I exported them off of the CF card which is leads to cleaner um, results, but you just miss out on some of the sounds, all right? Because some of the sounds don't come from inside the Octatrack. But to save time, because this week is a very hectic week, and I hope you guys will work with me. You know, I did it that way. And, but you get cleaner sounds. Um, here's a little tip for the sample, because the sample isn't, it's, it's how I recorded it not necessarily how I played it out because I got it off the CF card. So detune the sample by tune it down by three beeps, by three clicks, three whole steps. And that's where I used it at and it'll fit all the other stems in, in that pitch. Down by three, just a sample, just take it down by three and then we'll be at the same pitch. All right, so, um, just a brief recap. I've been using the scenes. Let's take it over here. Boom. I've been using the scenes on this crossfader a lot. And on this beat, I made, hold on. No, this is not the one I was working on. This is not the beat right here. But for the beat Za that I just did, I used up about maybe one, two, I used about six scenes on the right hand side. And what the scenes basically do is gives me quick access to different effects. And I've been using the effects as transitions, dynamic transitions. So having a cutoff filter on one of them and then a reverse cutoff filter, which is, you know, like a, 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 a high pass filter on one, a low pass filter on the other, um, using the rate taking the sample rate back to zero. And you could do, you could replicate all this stuff like on an MPC or SP404 by just, well, on an MPC definitely by copying your program, copying your, your program screen, make a separate program out of that, and then make all those drastic changes in the second program. So when you, so when you um, switch, from sequence one, that's playing program one, to sequence two, that's playing that copied program 
all those changes will be in that copy program. Boom. That's basically the same way I'm doing not the track, just doing it with the crossfader. All right. So yeah, I'm using a lot more scenes to get a lot more out of a briefer, a smaller, a shorter sample. Okay. Um, sample came off of this record right here by Floor Plum. Floor Purum. All right. Boom. Okay. So, I had enough questions. We got up to enough questions in the ass butter section of the Patreon, I think, for this month, that I can go ahead and answer some of these questions. All right, so first question is from my from the, our, our dear respected brother, Joe Soul, and it reads, peace, bro. I'm still trying to figure out how you mix your drums. I remember seeing the video you posted sometimes back where you were talking about LFO and sidechain compression. I think that you were using Ableton with some outboard gear. Do you have a video going over your workflow? My own is pretty good, but I always find myself spending more time on mixing everything else and neglecting the drums. Last beat, I did not post Last beat I did and posted on Instagram is a perfect example. And that's from our homie, Joe Soul. So there's a couple questions in here. I'll answer, I'll try to get to all of them. All right, so basically I mix my drums based upon what sound I'm going for. If I'm going for something heavy, I tend to mix heavier. If I'm going for something lighter or more experimental with like different type of sounds, you know, but I think a good rule of thumb to always figure out is with, with your production and in that beat in particular, who are the main characters and who are the supporting characters, right? Everybody can't be a main character, meaning everybody can't have the same amount of screen time, right? So you gotta figure out who who are who like what instruments are going to be the main characters and what instruments are, are setting those main characters up for greatness and success right and mix accordingly so um, i know the kick is the main part or you know the driving one of the driving forces in my music um i'll get um so getting to the side chain part of it is that I used to do, I, I call it a ghetto side chain, but I used to explain that in my videos, where it's basically, you can stack your mix in a certain way where the kick drum is the loudest thing and the sample is the quietest thing, like 50% volume of the kick drum. And then you push the compressor until the mix evens back out until it sounds normal again. and you have your ducking effect. But the reason why I'm calling that a ghetto, a bootleg, uh, uh, <laughs> a, a budget side chain, because you're not side chaining anything for real, is that that's not real side chain compression. Because the kick drum is still in the mix. The, it's not like you have a separate kick drum triggering something. You're compressing the sum of all the parts, meaning that the kick drum is also being compressed. So it's like, you don't want to compress your, your drum. You want to compress the other mix. You want to compress the, the the other components of the mix against the kick the kick drum. So, in true side chaining, you want the kick drum to trigger the compression. So, let's come down here, and I'm gonna show you. I've shown this before, and um, I think somebody else real quick had a question about outboard mixing gear. Jeremy Brown had a question about outboard mixing gear and what's my weapon of choice. This is kind of getting that too. All right, so let me bring the tripod down here. So let me bring it down anymore, boom. All right, I've shown this before. Um, I get my light better over here. Okay, but right here, this is a DBX 166. Excel, all right? And <clears throat> I send 
my mix through here, through the end, through the end one, you know, the input one and the input two, the left and right input, for the exception of the kick. Okay, so on the back of here you'll see input A and input input B, and I have my left and right channel going into there, out the main out of the octa track, but but my kick drum does not come out the main out of my octa track. It comes out the cue out of my octa track. Okay, I send that kick drum into my interface and I route that kick drum by itself into the side chain input of this DBX. So what is actually happening is the kick drum isn't being compressed. The kick drum is gonna stick to my interface, but I'm also sending a kick deck that same kick drum signal back out to this DBX to make the rest of the mix duck along duck every time it hears the kick drum come through but it's but because the kick drum is not actually coming through input a and b input one and two on this DBX it, the kick drum isn't being compressed the kick drum is just triggering the compression okay because you want your kick drum to be nice and big. Let me get, I'm getting it. Boom. We want our kick drum to be nice and big and beautiful and bold. We don't want our kick drum to be ducked. Like we don't want our kick drum causing the ducking and also being ducked at the same time. That's not what you want. So that's why I call that the, the ghetto compression. That's not what we want. All right. So, getting to Jeremy Brown's question, <laughs> yeah, I like to send, I like to do that side chain compression, right? That all happens before it hits my computer, before it hits Ableton. So it's like, I'm basically sending a pretty well packaged mix all, already into the computer, right? Then I have a little mastering chain that I'll go over in a future video in the computer, okay? All right, that I use, and it's not too much. I use, um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now. Um, I slap an EQ on the, so what I end up with is two tracks in Ableton. I end up with my kick drum, and then I end up with, on one track, and then on the other track, I end up, on, well, the kick drum is on a mono track, and on a stereo track next to it, I have everything else. The sample, the keys, the snare, the hat, and that's all ducking because it's the side chain is being triggered by the kick drum all right but so yeah so so boom if i mute that kick drum while i'm looking at my screen at ableton if i mute the kick drum and just play the you know the rest of the mix that's left i can still hear the duck without the kick drum being there and that's because it was triggered by the side chain input it's not as the kick isn't actually in that part on that track all right that's beautiful because i want the kick to be bold, I want it to be big, I don't want it to sound smushed or ducked. When you start compressing your kick drum, you start taking off the, the bottom end of your kick drum. You squeeze it and you lose the low end that makes a kick a kick, all right? So, moving on, um, yeah. On the master chain that I use in Ableton, pretty straightforward, okay? I slap on a, a uh, on the master chain. I slap on an EQ8. Simple, roll off the bottom, roll off somewhere around, you know, 30, 20, 20 to 30 hertz is where I roll off because you just don't want a lot of rumble in your mix. After that, I slap on Brainworks Master Desk plugin. That's what I've been using as of late. I fluctuate on these things, you know, sometimes I use this, sometimes I do that. But yeah, for, as, for the last couple months, I've been using the Master Desk by Brainworks. And after that, I just use a um, a ceiling limiter that comes stock in Ableton, and that's basically that. Okay, any um, uh, Miss La Shoe? I think that's how I'm pronouncing it right. It could be M S La Shoe, but I'm just going to say Miss La Shoe. Um, going to go ahead and answer uh, this question. And, and this person is from the newbie category. I normally wouldn't answer a newbie's question, only but again questions, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it. And I'll post this video up for the newbies so they can see. May, maybe we could bump some people up to butter gang. They'll be encouraged, you know? 
see what we got going on on the on on, on the big boy side, on the big boy, big girl side. All right. So um, yeah, about workflow. My workflow is dictated by what gear I'm using. All right. So perfect example. Analog steps. I got a mother 32 over here, right? And I also, and even with like FM sense, I got a, a Yamaha DX27 over here. If I scope the sound on, well definitely, if, if I scope the sound on the mother, right? It's analog sense. I tweak, I tweak, I tweak, patch cable, patch cable, patch cable. If I, and I do that for one pattern, I need to comp I need to do it for the rest. I need to go ahead and build the rest of the patterns and insert that sound now before moving on because it's going to be very hard for me to do tweaks and get back to that sound, right? With the FM synth, you can save your sound digitally, but it's such an old synthesizer that I really don't be trying to say nothing on it. It's from the late 80s that like, you know, I go in there, I tweak, and I wanna use the stuff as it is. So, with workflow, because I'm using synthesizers a lot, and it takes a lot of tweaking, and every, you know, you could, in that, in that case scenario, you could always just go ahead and record into your synth, meaning you could sample the sound in as a singular note and then play it out in the synth, but I wanna do more stuff inside the synth, right? So, Excuse me. What I end up having to do is I build the first pattern, right? Bang, bang, bang. I build a very nice skeleton of the pattern and I start figuring out what, what synthesizer sounds I'm going to use. Right, so I set up the Mother 32 to a nice bass sound. I may set up the work stat to a nice arpeggiated sound and the Yamaha DX27 to some good keys, all right? Now, these aren't the only sounds that I'm going to use, but these are going to act as the, the you know, the, the melodic or the, you know, the tonal elements of my rhythm section, right? So what I'll then do is I'll come back to the rest of the beat, which is, you know, the sample and the drums and stuff like that. And I'll make sure that I flesh out the rest of the skeleton, meaning pattern two with the drums and the sample and pattern three with the drums in the sample. So then I can lay down that bass, lay down those keys, lay down that, those other synth lines, record them in, or do what I need to do with them before moving on. So I have those same exact sounds on each pattern. Because if I were to tweak, go like if I were to do one pattern, then begin tweaking the synth in a different way, adding to that same pattern, then move on to the next pattern and try to get the synth back to sound the way it sounded on the first pattern. So it sounds, you know, like the same instrument on both pattern A and pattern one and two, it would be a real pain in my ass. So what I do is I, I, I choose, I look at my synths as members of a rhythm section. Get their, make sure I make the skeleton of the whole beat first insert their parts, record them in, or leave them however I'm going to leave them, and then I can move on as far as, like, like if I record them in, I can move on and then do other things with those synths. But I need to have the complete skeleton fleshed out for that to happen. I hope that made some sort of sense. That I, I, so, and, and, <laughs> not conclusion, but to, to tie this up nicely. I have to make the skeleton completely out before embellishing. I know some people, um, and I think I think it's good that I do that because I've made beats that are only like two sequences or two patterns, and it's like I can live with them just being two patterns because they're so embellished and I can just play with the mutes and stuff like that. But when I have to make different, when I'm thinking like I might not have a chance or I could mess things up if I don't create the skeleton now, it forces me to think about the beat with more structure instead of just embellishing a two or a four bar loop to death. All right? 
hope that answered that. All right, and um, the outboard mixing gear. Okay, uh, food, clothing, and shelter. You said I went over ADSR um, uh, process. I would have liked to hear before and after back to back. That's something I can do for the next video. Um, definitely, when I come back off the road, food, clothing, and shelter is one of my dearest homies. You know, from the ATL area too. Much love to him. Um, yeah, it's been fun, you guys, answering the Patreon questions. We'll get some um, uh, some new questions up there soon. I mean, well, I'll you know we'll do this again soon. Uh, I'm gonna be blogging from the road. Catch y'all there. Peace. One.